Good afternoon and happy Friday. This is Audrey Russo, President and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council. And joined with me is Jonathan Kirsting on our team, Vice President of Visibility and someone who oversees a lot of media for us as well. So a couple of things, I just wanna set the table before we bring in our guests who I'm pretty excited to have a conversation with. And I wanna thank Huntington Bank for their support in this series since we started it. Today's day number 35, hard to believe. And uh, they've been leading a lot of work in terms of the SBA and making sure that companies are getting what they need through the incentive packages that have been offered. And I also wanna give a shout out to AT&T for their continued sponsorship in the work that we do and all that they're doing for our local community and across the state of Pennsylvania in terms of COVID-19 and giving people the support that they need. So just as a programming note for next week, we have a great lineup of guests already. We have the global CIO of Zoom. They've just made an acquisition and uh, we'll be able to talk about all things Zoom and security. We also have uh, Jeff Broadhurst who's coming in. He's the president and CEO of Eden Park Hospitality Group. We're gonna hear from Rich Lunak, president and CEO of Innovation Works and Patrick McKenna from One America Works, who's gonna be discussing this new paradigm for attracting back businesses to cities like Pittsburgh. So a little bit about the technology and then I'm gonna introduce Farnham. You are all on mute. We've done that intentionally to make sure that we've eliminated unnecessary noise and entertainment that comes from your home or wherever you're located but we're giving you an opportunity to ask questions. So you're gonna ask questions and it's in the chat and we'll sh we should have enough time to allow for the questions to be answered. This is not a time for you to sell anything. This is a chat, we're trying to create some intimacy and uh, engagement with the leaders who are helping us move forward. So with that, I am thrilled, thrilled to bring on today's guest, Farnham Jahanian. He is the, the president of Carnegie Mellon, and he is someone that I think of as a good friend in terms of how he has risen from his original role at Carnegie Mellon and leading Carnegie Mellon through a very, very interesting and fascinating time. So welcome, Farnham. Thank you for yep. being here. It's good to be with you. Thanks very much for the invitation. Happy to be with you. So well, let's just jump into a question and then you, know, you, can, you can take it from there. So CMU had to pivot quickly, right at the out, you know, right at the outset of this you know, pandemic. From an operational perspective, can you talk about the journey that you've actually been on in terms of maintaining continuity of education and research? We count on you. Sure. First of all, uh, let me say thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you, Audrey, Jonathan, Huntington Bank for sponsoring and also, of course, hosting uh, this conversation. Uh, these conversations are so important, uh, especially during uh, uh, the current climate, the crisis that we're going through. It's good to be with you. I also want to extend my best wishes. I see a lot of faces on Zoom. Uh, extend mm -hmm. my best wishes to all of you and your families during this time. I hope you're all staying um, safe and, and well. Uh, Audrey, I should tell you that I've had the privilege of working with you folks at the Pittsburgh Technology Council. I appreciate the work that you're doing. You've been such an important partner, not only for Carnegie Mellon, also serving as uh, uh, times as spokesperson, also providing all sorts of services and support for companies, small and large. Again, thank you for all yeah. that, that you do. So now to your question, as everybody knows that, you know, our lives have just been turned upside down in a matter of weeks. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and, and this situation is constantly evolving and, uh, and without any doubt, uh, not only these are unprecedented times, but it's testing every organization uh, unlike anything we've seen before. So, I should tell you that CMU's response has been multifaceted and, um, and it has involved almost every unit on campus. From sort of a stepping back and look at the principles that we've applied to it, obviously our first goal was ensuring continuity of uh, our core mission, which is our research and education mission, while at the same time protecting and ensuring the health and wellness of our uh, entire community 
while maintaining certain protocols and listening, of course, to health experts and others when it comes to wearing masks and social distancing. But if you step back and look at Carnegie Mellon, unlike most private sector enterprises, many of them on this call, we really have three different kinds of businesses. One is, of course, is our core education mission. The other part is all the amazing research that we do on campus with our faculty and students. And the third part, one often people forget about, is our residential community. And that residential community means 4,000 students, 4,500, who live on campus in our dormitories, and then another 10,000 who live in the neighborhood around uh, Pittsburgh. In fact, let me start with the last one, with the residential community. At the end of January, we started actually communicating with our folks about the pandemic. Uh, very quickly after that, we asked all of our students and faculty staff who were coming back from China and other countries to uh, self-isolate. And right during spring break, which was in early March, we made the decision to take all of our instructions online and ask our students who had gone back to their families to visit, to ask them to stay home. Uh, even with that, we have ended up with about 400 to 500 students who still live in our residential community. And we estimate about 7,000 students who are still live in Pittsburgh. Many of our graduate students call Pittsburgh home, of course, as you would expect. Um, so in a matter of three days, we took 2,500 courses and 4,900 sections of those courses online. Now, of course, CMU brought its uh, technology know-how to, to bear, but it was still a Herculean effort. I give a lot of credit to my faculty colleagues. Uh, I sit here smiling and saying, we did it in three days, but honestly, our faculty staff did an amazing job of doing that. In addition to doing that, uh, that was around middle of March, and a few days after that, we announced that we were going to take all of our research to the extent that we can also online, and we were quite successful actually in, 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 in doing that also. Since then, of course, as you would expect, our instructions are delivered online and remotely, uh, although we have thousands of students who are still living in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. The 400 students who live on our campus, uh, we still have dining services for them, but it's a pickup service. Uh, we have hundreds of essentially employees who are providing critical support and function for the university who still come to campus. I'm grateful to them uh, for still uh, doing that. And a number of other employees, most of our employees are all, and faculty staff are working remotely. I should tell you that we are now at the point that we are moving from what I refer to as crisis management to what you would expect is planning for next year. So there's a lot of planning that's taking place for next year. One thing that I want to mention is that the planning isn't about just a budget. It's really also looking at all the things that we're learning about remote instruction and see what we can learn from it, such that in the fall, in the likely scenario that some students are going to be on campus, some students may still be remote and so on, we'll be able to provide them amazing, essentially, quality of instruction and improve the learning outcome through a hybrid model, um, I hope, that we'll be able to deliver. Uh, and I really hope, and, and I'm optimistic, that we're going to have thousands and thousands of our students back on campus. I'll wrap up the response to your, your question by saying that, in fact, looking at our admissions, it looks great uh, for our freshman class, for our graduate programs. As you yeah. know, about 90% of our students are not even from the state of Pennsylvania. They come from all around the country, or all around the world. So we're optimistic, putting a lot of contingencies in place to have in a stage fashion, as I say, we go from crisis management to planning, stage fashion to in a phase fashion to bring our research on board back to campus over the next several months, bring our students back and many of the services that we provide students. That sort of is a summary of what we've been well, through for the past couple of months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 it seems like a year ago when I remember hearing about uh, spring break. So. I know. It's, it's crazy. So on, you know, on this particular program that we've been doing, we have talked frequently about being sort of Pittsburgh proud. And you've known that both you and I are adopted Pittsburgh, adopted Pittsburgh as our hometown. Sure. You know, from the vaccine work, 
being done at the University of Pittsburgh to the rapid deployment of a new ventilator technology by Philips. You know, Pittsburgh innovators have once again stepped forward to help change the world. Mm -hmm. And in this case, hopefully save the world. Carnegie Mellon has certainly been playing a meaningful role in responding to the current crisis. So can you tell us about what you've been up to? How have you been leveraging the research? What's the innovation? We've seen some things in the news, but I know there's more. <laughs> before I get to that's a terrific question and, and uh, close to my heart. But before I get to the, to the research part of it, let me tell you that what you said about Pittsburgh, you know, I, this is my sixth year in Pittsburgh. I've come to love this city and, and I've embraced it for all that it offers. I said this long time ago when I came to Pittsburgh, that there's this amazing alignment of public and the private sector and our foundations and, and the civic leaders and so on. I've lived all around the world. I've lived all around the country. There is something truly unique about Pittsburgh. Maybe it goes back to you know, 30 years ago when the uh, steel industry uh, was, was uh, imploding. But the truth is that uh, Pittsburgh knows how to come together. And candidly, over the past couple of months, this is once again, this is not just hyperbole, this is really true. You've seen how the private and the public sector and the, our wonderful foundations in the community and civic leaders and, and nonprofits such as yours have come together to, to help the community. Like every other organization, including many of our academic uh, friends in Pitt and Duquesne and Point Park and, and, and so on, um, our faculty staff mobilize to support the community. I can go through a list of things that we have done in terms of collecting supplies from test tubes to face masks to trying to come up with innovative day ways of um, uh, um, 3D printing of, you know, PPEs and so on. We've done all of that like everybody else in this town who's rolled up their sleeves. But when it comes to research, there are a couple of things that I want to share with you. And I'm going to try to be brief. And I'll give you a couple of links if you're interested in following. One is the one that you've been hearing about called COVID-CAST, C-O-V-I-D-CAST. And this is a work that my colleague, Roni Rosenfeld, uh, uh, who's the head of our machine learning department, and Ryan Tipsharani have done. And Ryan is in our stat uh, department and our machine learning department. Turns out this group, for the past many years, at least eight or 10 years, had been working with CDC doing some of the most sophisticated flu forecasting. And in fact, CMU, you may or may not know this, our audience may not know this, that CD CMU is one of the two centers of excellence for flu uh, yeah, uh, forecasting. And so they wanted to bring that science and that forecasting capability to pandemic. The challenge, however, here is that um, we don't have enough data. So over the last couple of months, Roni and Ryan and their team have been working. You've heard the announcement with Facebook. There's also Google data that we're getting. We're, getting, we're also working with major national providers. They finally have brought the data that they need to, to be able to do not only now casting, which is predicting what's happening now, but also they soon will be able to release their forecasting that's going to look down the road for the next four weeks in what's happening. And it's done not only at the global level, at the national level, you can zoom down at the state level. And what's amazing about it, now you're able to do it at the county level. The reason that's important, it's because it goes far beyond what you get on television, this many deaths and, and this many infections and so on and some of the modelings that keep going up and down. This brings and integrates a bunch of data sources. What's, what's incredible is that you can do it at the hospital referral, essentially, uh, units, if you will, which is roughly corresponds to a set of counties, say, around Allegheny County. It's going to give us a lot of insight, not only into what's happening today, but as we're going to bring, hopefully, people back to work, it's going to give us some visibility in terms of what's happening locally and be able to pull the lever and hopefully regulate this return back to work with some really fine grained data that is going to be hopefully helpful. Uh, I'm hoping that it would be helpful with that. It's really cool stuff. The link for it is covidcast.cmu.edu. I encourage you to look at it. I know I have a bunch of technologists on the call. 
If you permit me, I want to share with you a, a couple of very quick uh, examples, other examples, um, Audrey. Um, the other one is a work that my colleague Po Shen Lo, who's in our math department, right. and a bunch of alum across the country who have that Po Shen recruited to work on a technology-based contact tracing. And the idea behind it is that uh, Bluetooth, while it's accurate, surprisingly, it's not as accurate we think it is. And so they use a combination of ultrasound and Bluetooth to reach a level of accuracy that's far, far uh, better. And furthermore, it's privacy preserving. Now, the details, of course, goes beyond the, this discussion. But they essentially have an app that allows us to take that app and hopefully hand it off to a lot of people, especially in more of a closed uh, community. And it's going to give us bring some, you know, uh, desperately needed technology, hopefully to help us with contact tracing. And a final thing that I want to say is, um, credit goes to uh, my dean of public policy information system. Uh, uh, Ramaya Krishnan and a bunch of economists and policy folks and computer scientists who have been working behind the scenes with Governor Wolf and his team yeah, and he, the Governor Wolf announced this a few weeks ago in bringing um, data driven uh, essentially analysis to how do we bring Pennsylvania's economy back to work. This is a very complex uh, uh, task, of course, and our work is one input into the decision making that's happening in Harrisburg. And of course, uh, what they're developing, as you probably heard, is they're developing a dashboard that allows us to under to better understand rather the inherent risks and benefits for reopening certain businesses, industries, sectors, and try to correlate that with some of the health risks. So, as you can tell, it's a lot happening, and and hopefully some of that is going to have a um, impact on our local community, of course, broadly on, 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 on the nation. So um, I think we have a question, Jonathan, I think from Seth Beckerman, if you want to. We do. We've got some great questions here, Corin. This is the best part of the show because we got some smart people in the crowd here. They got some great questions. So from so Bring it on. Seth Beckerman, he's saying uh, many are warning that foreign students are here to exploit research and technology from the universities where they and uh, colleagues do their work. Uh, do you see this as a problem? And if so, um, if any strategies are, is CMU employing to, to mitigate this alleged uh, problem? This is really a great question. First of all, one thing that we have to recognize, if you look at the research enterprise of this nation, the amazing innovations that is happening in this country, and if you look back, particularly for the technology folks around this call, you look at the past 20 or 30 years, how we have come as a nation to dominate so many markets that are driven by advances in technology. There is no question that we have had a lot of essentially foreign students who've come here, who eventually immigrated, became permanent residents and citizens here and stayed in this country. I am actually one of them who came to this country in 1977 and of course have now the honor of uh, leading one of the greatest institutions in this country. Uh, the truth is that that's been core to who we are as a country, that's core to our economy. We are a nation of immigrants. So recognizing that, that is going to be part of, of our future of our academic institutions. Now, having said that, I am not naive uh, to dismiss that there is intellectual property theft. We know that many companies in this country are worried about IP theft. We know there are economic implications. We know there are national security implications. So we should do everything we can do, not only in universities, but also in our uh, private sector to protect the intellectual property that's created uh, and paid for by corporations, by citizens of this country, and so on. So we do a lot to protect our intellectual property. As you know, we do also do classified work on campus uh, that has very, very strict conditions uh, associated with it. We also have a large number of students who come here to be educated, and they get their education. Many of them stay, uh, including myself, for example. 
but many also go back to their countries. And in some ways, the best way that we can share our values is to educate these students. Some of them go back to their home countries, whether they're in Asia Pacific, whether they're in the Middle East, whether they're in India and so on. And in those cases, there is no serious threat in terms of uh, sharing our research because first of all, the research that's in public domain, it's shared with everybody. That's the nature of you know, open research. And the education we're offering, we're offering and we're not the only ones to do it. This happens all over the world. And in some ways, having these students come be part of our community, enrich our community, some of them stay and many of them go back and hopefully when they go back, take our values and take um, some of our liberal democratic values back to their home country. So I hope that answers yeah, your great question. Answer. Great answer, absolutely. So have any of us CMUs of international projects and campuses been affected? I would assume they have to be just as impacted. Great question. Um, we have several campuses um, globally. Of course, our home base is in Pittsburgh. We also have campuses, by the way, in Silicon Valley. We have a group of students that are part of our program in, in Los Angeles. But we have um, three physical um, um, places. We do a lot of research, of course, globally with a lot of, you know, in, in an international arena. But we have an undergraduate program in Qatar. Uh, we have a graduate program in Rwanda, in Africa, and we also have a program in Australia. All of them were affected. Uh, one of our campuses, Cutter, actually went to remote operation before the Pittsburgh campus did, a week before we did. But all of them have gone online, do remote essentially instructions, following the same patterns and so on. One thing I should say about our education remotely is, a student who gets a degree, for example, on an undergraduate degree in computer science or the business program and so on in our Cutter campus, they get exactly the same education as they would get in Pittsburgh. And that is part of what our trustees expect. So in terms of the quality of the program, it's exactly what we have in Pittsburgh. And by the way, in the quality of students, uh, they, they hold their own uh, nationally. So They've been affected just like the rest of the world. Um, they follow some of our policies and guidelines, but as you know, healthcare is very local also. And many of those protocols are dictated locally, but so far they're in lockstep with Pittsburgh. Thank you for that question. Absolutely. Anyway, can I add one more thing? We Absolutely. decided, and I, and, and I neglected to mention this, uh, you know, we can't underestimate the impact of this on our students. Everyone is impacted, of course. I mean, you look at the un unemployment numbers, you look at the, um, the, the um, um, uh, uh, over 70,000 lives that are lost without any doubt. This is not only heart heartbreaking, it's astonishing just in over a few weeks how our lives have been up turned upside down. But within the context of our academic institution, um, those of you who remember your graduation, mine was last century. Um, I tell you, this has been quite hard on our students. You know, in the middle of the semester, we told them, pack your bags or don't come back. But the seniors, you remember your second semester, a senior year in college. So graduation means a lot to the students and their families. What we committed to them is that they're going to have graduation next year, sometime physical in-person graduation on campus, a commencement. But this Sunday at 10.30 a.m., we're gonna have a uh, conferral of degrees, which is going to be a 30, 40 minute, essentially, event that's going to be broadcast live and it's gonna be available online. Um, they're gonna be, it's not a formal commencement ceremony, but it's gonna have some of the elements of that. Uh, a number of us, including my deans and the provost and our chair of the board is gonna be on it. But there are also going to be a few surprises uh, from our uh, <laughs> Super cool. Okay. I'm going to so we have, folks we have a couple here. of questions out there, Jonathan. One from, I can see from Larry Zana that I think is pretty relevant. Yeah. So we have Larry ask that question or you want me to ask it? You can just Larry, ask you it. ask it. Okay, All Larry. Right, so Where's Larry? Larry, you okay. ask it. <laughs> Larry, we're unmuting you. Hi, yeah, uh, a lot of high school, high school juniors 
who might be looking to apply to uh, college this coming year are concerned that virtual learning might affect uh, how, how colleges look at their grades and test scores and so forth. Can you talk about CMUs, uh, how they might be adjusting to this? Absolutely. Let me say, address it in two ways. One is you're raising an important issue about um, online learning and so on and remote learning. You know, when I talked about dry research, what I didn't say is that we're bringing at CMU a lot of innovations in terms of how do we improve learning outcome for students. I'm one of those people who doesn't believe that residential experience of students is, is just going to go away. Everybody believes, oh, we're just going to teach people on Zoom. And the truth is, I love Zoom, don't get me wrong. But uh, learning goes far beyond delivery of bits online. I'm a computer scientist. I know there are a bunch of computer scientists on this call. The truth is, we know how to deliver bits online, but that's not the same as learning. So learning takes place. The mentoring and the interaction and so on is so important. So I think the residential experience is here to stay, but I really do believe, I'm, I'm gonna get to your question in a moment, but I really do believe that uh, there is a transformation. Audrey has heard me talk about it. There's a transformation of higher ed that's coming. And I think this pandemic is going to accelerate the transformation. It doesn't mean everything is gonna go remote and online. But it really what's going to do is something that I actually think is, is profoundly impactful. Um, we're going to have to think about how do we use technology to improve learning outcomes. We need to think about how does technology enhance the experience of students, whether they're in class, they're remote, and different modes of uh, uh, interaction. Even in, in for our, our conservatories, our fabulous school of drama or music school, technology really does play a role. You need that, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interaction, but we're discovering new ways of enhancing their education through technology. And I hope CMU and other institutions locally will lead that transformation. I hope we'll become a model uh, for, for the rest of the nation to follow. And I hope that will somehow get impacted uh, at the K through 12. Now to your question. We will be very flexible. I mean, this year's admission was already in progress. So the impact on admissions for seniors that are gonna be our freshmen next year was non-existent, except that they had to spend half of their semester at home studying. Uh, but for juniors, especially if in the fall, many of our students are um, gonna be remote. Um, we will take a look and our admissions folks have thought about this and they recognize that there are going to be some discontinuities. We can't use the same lens that we used last year and we have to be uh, much more flexible with it. Having said that, in our admission process, we're also never ever stuck to just a set of quantitative measures, far from it. We look at the entire portfolio that the students submit and use, and it's somewhat subjective, use that because otherwise you will miss a lot of amazingly gifted students who may not numerically be at the top of their <laughs> game, but in reality are the ones who are gonna be some of the best students on campus. Thank you for that question. Uh, it is a stressful time for high school students, I know, but I have to tell you, having had three kids in college, even more stressful on parents when the kids apply to college. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Is there is there one more question that we can ask, Jonathan, and then I can. We have so in. many questions. <laughs> we, we can't yeah. get to them all, and I really yeah, wish I that we could here. Um, actually, there's a really great question from from Kenny Chen here, talking about. Um, ah, it just came off my off my uh, scroll here. Basically, it's was, it was based around the idea of maintaining research ethics during this this day and age. Um, what are yeah. your thoughts on, on trying to maintain these ethics uh, through, through the new times that we're in? I, I think that's an issue that's with us regardless of um, uh, the current climate. I mean, perhaps the current climate because we're remote may exacerbate it. But the truth is that we have strict code of conduct when it comes to our research. And it's not just CMU, Pitt has it, Duquesne has it, all academic institutions have it. In fact, if you get federal funding, there are a set of guidelines and, and not only in terms of just reporting to the federal government, but in terms of conduct of research that you have to worry about 
there are also issues surrounding um, reproducibility of research results that we spend a lot of time uh, uh, focusing on. Um, would the current climate make it a little bit harder, potentially? Uh, but this really goes back to if you think about a university as a business, just like businesses that the folks on this call are running, it's all about business continuity and managing risk associated uh, with your businesses. And, and we're, we're paying a lot of attention to that. Our VP of research, especially and his team, are paying a lot of attention to it. It's a really an important question you're raising, but it goes far beyond the current climate that we're in. And uh, Carnegie Mellon has this unique role of being tremendous value to the world and through the innovations and the work and through your ranking and all the different departments. But you also have a tremendous role in our region and in our city. And, you know, what do you think about where we're headed? And, you know, as a partner who has intentional output to the health of this region, what, what are you thinking? What are you worried about? And what do you think the tech sector should be doing to be helpful to both Carnegie Mellon and beyond? So I mean, you, you, I've gotten to know you and, and you're a friend. You know my, my temperament is that I, I am just an eternal optimist. I, I'm not putting my head in the sand. I mean, I am not at all dismissing mm -hmm. the um, incredible challenges that we face as society, we face as a nation, we face, of course, as a state and, 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 and our city uh, without any doubt. Uh, but I think uh, what you will see, and I hope uh, um, what I started with when I talked about Pittsburgh and this unique alignment of public and private sector and the foundations and the civic leaders and so on that we have, mm -hmm. I think is going to serve us well. Just look what has happened over the past eight weeks. And when I make the comparison, I'm not taking any pleasure in making the comparison. But look how Pittsburgh has handled, Allegheny County has handled, and some of our surrounding county, the current epidemic. Uh, we are doing, knock on wood, better than many other regions, many right. other large cities. A lot of credit goes to civic leaders, a lot of credit goes to Rich Fitzgerald and his mm -hmm. team and, and Bill, our mayor, and, and a great foundation and enterprises. Um, I talked about how CMU took everything online. The mm -hmm. truth is Pat Gallagher and Ken Gormley, all of the university leaders in this town, um, you know, we have about eight or 10 of them. They all made the decision around the time we did. We actually, by the way, uh, all the university presidents, we have a standing call every Tuesday morning at 7.30 a.m. We compare notes and so on. Mm -hmm. I bet you there are not a lot of other places in the country that Every Tuesday morning, they get up at 7:30. All the university presidents in the same town and 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 uh, and compare notes. So I, I'm really optimistic that this town will come together. The challenges are enormous. The economic impact is undeniable. We'll come together and get through it. I'm confident of that. What should the tech sector do, or what should the private sector do? I have a request for you. Speaking as a university president, yes. well, first of all, you do a lot for the community. First and foremost, I think the tech sector should fare better than many other sectors of economy, just because of the nature of the work and the impact of the tech sector on the broader economy. I mean, that is our hope, that's our expectation. This is what preliminary, what the data shows, and I hope that's the case. The second point is, please give students opportunities for internship, give them opportunities for jobs, hire our kids. We have thousands and thousands of them graduating. We have thousands of them are gonna be looking for internships. Mm -hmm. Find ways where even if it means you uh, cut a little bit here and there, get ways where we bring them into our economy, give them opportunities. I, I'm really concerned about this generation of kids who are gonna go through the next few years, and I don't mean just this summer, over the next few years with this economy, we need to not only take care of everybody who is displaced and it's, it's uh, disenfranchised in some ways because of the pandemic, but let's pay some attention also to all the kids. This is coming from a university president, to all the students, I should say. Um, I call them kids because they're the same age as my kids, but we need to take care of them and make sure that we find pathways for them to enter our economy. 
So there's a question here um, from Jay Katarinczyk, and I'm, I'm just going to speak for him. It's, uh, he wants to know, do you foresee any impact, both positive and obviously negative, on the commercialization of innovation occurring on campus as a result of COVID-19? Well, first of all, Jay, I can't see you, but it's, but it's great that you're on this call. Hope you and your family are doing well. Thanks, um, thanks for doing this call for him. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's great to see everyone. Um, I, I actually think, here's, Jay, here's what we're doing. And I, and I think in the intermediate term, I think we're going to be in good shape. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that we're going to take back to uh, in a pilot fashion and a staged fashion, and we're going to communicate this with the broader community very soon, is our research enterprise. Remember, bringing students back to campus is a very different proposition mm -hmm. um, because you have a group of 30 students are in class and an hour later they go to a different class with a bunch of other students and an hour later with 50 other students and there's the residence halls. Right. And we know especially what 18 and 22 year olds, they congregate, they hang out. It's a different proposition. But when you look at our research enterprise, and I know you, you know uh, Michael McQuaid and, and our provost, uh, Jim Garrett, yeah. they are working with a team developing essentially a set of scenarios and a staging of how do we bring our administration and our research enterprise back to campus over the next few months. It's not that we're gonna flip the switch and bring everybody back, but it's no different from other businesses thinking about how they're gonna come back to work, right? What you have to do is you have to re-engineer your workflow, uh, listen to the health experts, uh, employ social distancing, face mask, and all of those things. Remind people that if they come to campus, it doesn't mean they go to go and get hang around with their buddies on campus. Mm -hmm. So we're actually very optimistic that in the next few weeks, we're going to bring some of the research back. And over time, we're going to bring more and more of that and more of the administration back which means the part of the university does the innovation, uh, uh, creation of knowledge and technology transfer is gonna come back, my expectation is, in fact, before much of our uh, instructional side. That's my prediction. Well, you're always the optimist and I know that and, um, and that's what we need. We actually need that. And, I've, and we've had some really good examples of some positive things happen across the tech sector just in the last couple of weeks. So life continues to go on. So I, we have extended our time about 10 minutes longer, but thoroughly have enjoyed this. And I know everyone has been on the call because they're staying on the call. So for those of you that have additional questions that we didn't get to, we'll share them with Farnham to see if he can answer them and post them on our site. Sure. Keep up the great work. We, we are your biggest fans and we want to make sure that you are, succeed, you are succeeding and that we're a part of this, both for the world, because we need the world to know about us. We need the world now. It'd be easy for the world to forget about us. And let's face it, when I say Carnegie Mellon's in Pittsburgh, they go, wow. And, you know, we got to use that. So thank you so much for your time, for your leadership for the work that you do. And thanks to everyone for being on this call today with us. And know that next week we have another packed week of really great people and uh, people who are adding to the whole tapestry of what it means to live in this new world. Cause we're not going back. It's a new world. Mm -hmm. so thank you very thank much you, for the Barnum. opportunity. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Good to be with you. Thank Good you. Stuff, we appreciate it. Thank you.